the principal of the college, respected professor Shiddhartha Shain, um, respected ma'am, Mrs. Anita Shain, professors, guests, and my dear students, monks and brahmacharis who are here. It's a great pleasure to be here once again. You keep introducing me as the minister in charge of the Vedanta Society. Well, that's true. But my real identity here is that I belong to Shikhan Mandir. So, <laughs> um, recently we organized uh, an interfaith conference on the birthday of Sister Nivedita. So, uh, on, on that occasion, we had uh, uh, talks on the life of Sister Nivedita and her views on interfaith harmony and there is representative from different religions. This, was, this conference was held in New York, in, in Manhattan. So, as a commemoration of that, we had a little gift which I have bought for Principal Maharaj, so I would like to hand over this gift to Amit Dr. Sharan. This is Breaking Barriers, uh, an interfaith conference on the birthday, on our 150th birthday anniversary of Sister Nivedita. On Saturday, October 28th in Manhattan, we had this conference. And a little pen. I heard a very interesting uh, story, a funny story, about uh, Professor Dinesh Sen from Professor Deepesh Chakravarti. Uh, who is a, uh, who teaches in University of Chicago, uh, and today I find that uh, Professor Shiddhartha Shen is the grandson of uh, Professor Dinesh Shen. The story is very very amusing, which uh, uh, Dinesh Babu has himself written uh, about his association with uh, Sister Nivedita. Very funny incident. Actually, he was working on the history of India in Bengali, and uh, Sister Nivedita was collaborating with him to translate this into English. Uh, one day, he writes, Dinesh Babu writes, that one day he was walking with uh, Sister Nivedita in the narrow lanes of Barbaja. And as usual, right, even now the situation is same, at that time a big bull stood there and it was charging through the narrow streets in uh, Barbaja. And everybody was jumping out of the way to, and taking shelter. And Dinesh Babu writes that I did what any self-respecting Bengali gentleman would do. I put the umbrella under my <laughs> elbow and leaving Sister Nivedita uh, on the street, I jumped into a shop to, <laughs> to escape from the bull. Afterwards, I peeked out to see what had happened and I saw Sister Nivedita standing calmly in the middle of the road and she looked at me and said, so, this is the courage with which you will fight the British. <laughs> so, um, Dipesh Babu told this in a lecture in Chicago University recently. But it's very indicative of the character of Sister Nivedita and the educational philosophy of Sister Nivedita. In fact, today I will speak a little bit about how far-sighted her thoughts, uh, her thoughts on education were. We all know that she was an educator from the very beginning. She had a school in Wimbledon where she used innovative techniques to teach school children. Um, she was influenced by two names which are very familiar to all the BA students here and MA students here. Pestal uh, Pestalozzi and Freud. So, uh, we all know that uh, Pestalozzi and Tribal, they were very great educators. One was, a, one was from Switzerland and Tribal was from Germany. Pestalozzi, we know that he was one of the first who uh, saw that close connection between psychology and education. He found that learning proceeds from, you, know, you do not directly get abstract knowledge, but actually learning proceeds from the concrete to the abstract. So, from the sensory experiences, children get abstract knowledge. That's what he discovered and he wanted to integrate that into, uh, into educational psychology. So, from the concrete to the abstract, this became 
a mantra for Sister Nivedita. All through her life, in England and later on when she came to India, uh, she used this as a formula. To teach children, you have to move from not directly to theoretical knowledge, not directly to chalk and talk, you know, uh, but from concrete experience, from sensory experience to abstract knowledge, to intellectual knowledge. So she always used to re repeat that, from concrete to abstract, from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the new. Pestalozzi's ideas were taken by Freud later on, who also added very deep insights of his own. We know the kindergarten system, we have all studied uh, in uh, BA and MED courses. So he was the one who started that. Freud's gifts, uh, I am sure we have all come across that in your educational psychology, uh, uh, educational philosophy uh, courses. He discovered that children learn through activity, uh, that play is important. Children are most at ease when they are playing. So how can we give education for, for very little children, very, very young children, through play? That idea also was taken up by Nivedita, that education comes through activity. So that was another idea which Nivedita took up. When she was in England, there was this gentleman, um, Ebenezer Cook, who was very much influenced by Pestalozzi uh, and by Freiburg. And uh, he taught this to Nivedita. He introduced her to the uh, Sesame Club, which was a club of intellectuals. At that time, uh, Lady Ripon, Lady Margeson, um, they were members of that club. George Bernard Shaw, he would speak at that club. Thomas Huxley would speak at that club. And it was through this club that Sister Nivedita, fin Nivedita finally met uh, Swami Vivekananda. Of course, we know the story how Swamiji inspired her to come to India and to take up the task of teaching children. She first spent some time here in Bhagavaja familiarizing herself with Indian conditions before she started her educational work. That also shows part of her educational philosophy that education cannot be imposed from outside. It must come from ground up. It must be rooted in the local culture. So she found out what is the life of Indians like. She tried, she made herself into, uh, uh, made herself as Indian as possible. After that, she began to think how to give education to uh, Indian children, especially to girls. That was the purpose of her life. Um, Swami Vivekananda, gave her this great mission, women's education in India. I remember a very touching incident. Towards the end of her life, her health was failing. And she had already established a Nivedita school, which is also which is there now in, in Calcutta. Her health was failing and she was to go to Darjeeling to recover, I think in Professor Bosch's uh, house, she stayed there. And she of course never came back, she died there. But she was leaving Calcutta to go this was several years after Swami Vivekananda had attained Mahasamadhi. So she paid a final visit to, the, to her school, Nivedita school. And the school was not doing too well at that time. Sister Christine had already gone back to the United States and there were troubles with the school. So the, it's very touching. She went there and she was weeping. She said that one mission my Guru gave me, Vivekananda gave me, to give education to Indian girls through this school and I failed in this mission because when I go away the school will shut down we will, will be, it will be finished, who will take care of this school? She had done so much as Professor Sain was saying for art, for science, for the Indian freedom fighting, for, for, for politics in India and so much but that one thing she said my guru has given me this mission and I am failing in this mission but in a uh, hundred years later, we know that she succeeded actually. Unselfishly, she gave her life for Vivekananda for India. And so what you do for Vivekananda, that Vivekananda will protect. So today we see, even if the school is doing very well, women's education is a big, big success in India. 
that is a very touching story and I, I always remember that. She wrote, writes that teachers must understand that the thought proceeds from concrete to abstract. Knowledge grows by experience and experience comes from senses. And two senses are always better than one sense as a fun foundation for knowledge. Today, we, we talk so much about uh, multimedia education. Uh, the children must see something, touch it, and uh, you know, come into physical contact with their subject of study. More than a hundred years ago, Sister Nivedita emphasized this, that it begins with sensory experience. It begins with the concrete, and then it goes to abstract knowledge. She speaks about very interesting insights she gives about uh, education. She speaks about training of the feelings and training of choice. Training of feelings and training of choice. That unless we train the feelings and unless we train a person to choose, the, our, she says our student has learned certain intellectual tricks that will enable him to earn his bread but it cannot, uh, it, it, uh, she says, he cannot appeal to the heart nor give life. So to inspire, you need training of the feelings and training of choice. I want to stop here and consider this for a while. She does not give so much importance to training of the intellect, but training of emotions and training of decision making, of choice. Just a little while ago, I was speaking with Professor Sain about some of the latest work going on in economics. Dan, Professor Daniel Kahneman, he got the Nobel Prize for economics uh, few, several years ago. He has written a very popular book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And Professor Sen has already read it, but I have not read it, still it's just sitting on my desk in, in, in uh, Manhattan. But the central idea for which he got the Nobel Prize was that in economic, in life, not only in economics, in life decisions are not made actually by rational choice. Often decisions are made by intuition. Often decisions are guided by feelings. This connection between irrationality and decision making, between emotion and choice has become a central focus for economics today. Many students are going from uh, India to western universities to work in economics and the field is this not the old kind of mathematical economics but the new kind of economics where the connection between decision making and feelings Sister Nivedita pointed this out more than a hundred years ago that in education training of the feelings, training of intuition and decision making is very important you see let's think about this we know many things but it's very difficult. One of the biggest problems in our life is translating what we know into our life. What we know, what we have studied, what we have understood, what we have agreed is good. How to implement that in life? If you go to any bookshop, you will find these self-help sections. Uh, how to become, uh, how to, um, you know, become rich in seven days, how to uh, overcome an anxiety, how to uh, get friends, how to be successful in life, and so many wonderful books. The shelves are packed with these books, and these are bestsellers. Now, if we could implement even 5% of that, our lives would be blessed. But somebody told me, Swami, I have read many of these books useless. Why? The ideas are good. But it has no effect on my life. We know so many things, but how can we change our life with those things, with those ideas? It's very difficult. Why is it difficult? There's a, uh, a psychologist in America right now, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. He he has worked on this. This gap between knowledge and doing, abstract knowledge and transformation of life. Then why is this gap there? He has written a book called The Happiness Hypothesis. It sounds uh, very uh, you know, superficial, but actually it's a very nice book, very, very deep, well thought out book. He says, why is it that we can learn many things, we can understand many things, we agree to many things, but we can't implement in our lives? Why not? 
For example, I agree it's very good to get up early in the morning and do meditation. Or to be very good to get up early in the morning and finish my studies. I will study two hours in the morning before everybody else gets up. Some decision like that. I agree. Next day in the morning, what happens is very cold. It's very cold here also in New York. Yesterday, was, uh, somebody asked me, How cold is it in New York? I said, When I came, it was not very cold, about minus 7, minus 8. I said, Oh, that is not cold, minus 7, minus 8. Uh, so it's very cold in the morning. And when you have to get up, it's very difficult to come out of uh, the blanket. Under the blanket, very difficult to come out. You shut, shut, shut off the um, alarm clock and go back to sleep. Why? You have decided that I will get up in the morning and finish my studies early in the morning. But when the time comes, you don't get up. Why? The difference is this. Jonathan Haidt explains it with a nice model. The model of an elephant and mahout. You know what a mahout is? The person who sits on the elephant and controls the elephant. He, uh, he says, the mouth controls the elephant. The mouth knows where uh, he has to. The elephant has to go. So mouth can, they can the mouth can read a map or to, these days GPS is there. Huh? So the mouth can guide the elephant uh, to go from point A to point B. Elephant cannot read a map. An elephant cannot read a map. The mouth wants to take the elephant from here to there. Now he will be successful. If the elephant agrees, if the elephant does not want to go, who is stronger, elephant or mouth? Elephant is much stronger. Mouth cannot drag the elephant. Elephant has to agree that I will go from here to there. If elephant does not agree, mouth cannot do anything. If elephant wants, if the elephant wants to go to the nearby shop and get bananas and eat bananas, <laughs> the mouth cannot stop the elephant. Elephant is much stronger. What is the relevance of this model? Uh, Professor Jonathan Hyde says, We are like that elephant and mahout. When you read something that it is good to get up early in the morning and do meditation on your studies, and you agree, who agrees? The intellect agrees. Buddhi, the intellect agrees. Yes, tomorrow I will get up early in the morning and study. Good. Next day in the morning, when you have to get up, who has to get up? Not the intellect. Body has to get up. And the body says, I did not agree to get up. <laughs> it is your plan. Body will say to the intellect, it, you are not suffering from the cold. I am suffering from the cold. So I will not get up. And the intellect has no power to drag the body out. So that's what happens to us. We understand many things with our intellect. We make many plans with our intellect. But the execution does not depend so much on the intellect as on emotion and feeling and on the, on the, on the, on the senses, on the body. So this gap is there between the mouth and the elephant. The mouth understands knowledge, books. We, we, we understand, intellect enjoys seminars, workshops like this. Body is not interested in workshop. Body is not interested in seminar. What the, so what does the elephant respond to? You can't explain it to the elephant. You have to train the elephant. That is Jonathan Haidt's conclusion. You have to train the elephant. Elephant responds to training, not to persuasion, not to books, not to ideas. Training is important for the elephant. If the elephant is well trained, then the elephant will respond to the commands of the mouth in the same way if our, if our emotions are trained, if our senses are trained, if our body is trained, then what you decide and understand by the intellect, you'll be able to implement through the body and, and, and the emotions. So, Sister Nivedita, 100 years ago, training of feeling and choice. Look at the word she uses, choice. Decision making. We make many decisions, New Year's resolution. Many New Year's resolution. 1st of January, 2nd January failed. <laughs> Why? The training of decision making has not been done. How to implement the decisions in our day to day life. Recently, there is a book which has become very popular in USA now. Robert Wright. 
uh, who is a Darwinian atheist, well-known writer who lives very close to New York in Princeton. He has written this book, uh, Why Buddhism is True. And there he writes, many insights I have got from Darwinian, uh, applying uh, Darwinian theory to psychology. I understand many things. Why I take these decisions? Why, for example, I like sugar? So there's a Darwinian reason uh, why we have a tendency to eat sugar. But I, now I know it's bad for my health. I know it's bad for my health, but he says I cannot resist a sugar-coated donut. Why not? Same question, the mouth and the elephant story. Robert Wright writes that. And then he says how spiritual practices, meditation, it can help in order to train our emotions and our decision making. He says the Western model has been dominated by Plato's uh, chariot model where the idea was the driver of the chariot, the rider of the chariot who controls the chariot. If the rider knows where he wants to go, he can guide the chariot there. If you know what you want, to know what is good is to be good. That was the idea. And Robert Wright says, that's so evidently false. I know what is good, but I can't be good. I can't translate my knowledge into, into action. This is a very ancient thing. It was very, very well understood uh, in Indian psychology. When Krishna went to Duryodhan, and Krishna taught Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, somebody said he should have taught it to Duryodhan, then the Mahavar war would have been prevented. But Krishna actually tried to teach Duryodhan. We know the story. Krishna tried to teach Duryodhan. Krishna told Duryodhan that what you are doing is adharma, bad. This is dharma, this is adharma, you should not follow the path of adharma, follow the path of dharma. <coughs> and what did Duryodhan reply? Crucial insight, what Jonathan Haidt is saying today, Duryodhan replied at that time in Mahabharata, he said, don't teach me dharma and adharma, I know. <laughs> Janami dharma, natyame pravritti. I know what is right, but my problem is, not that I do not know, knowledge I have got, but I know what is right. But I don't want to do it. Janami adharma, nasyame nivritti. I know what's wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. I know that. But I can't stop myself. I can't stop myself. I want to do that. Kenapi devena. Yadhisthitena kenapi devena. Yatha niyojito asmita tha karomi. There is some force within me which forces me along in a, in, a, in a particular path and as I'm forced in that path, I do that though I know it is wrong. Same problem, what Duryodhana is saying thousands of years ago that Jonathan Haidt is saying, that uh, Robert Wright is saying Sister Nivedita gives the solution. The solution is not intellectual education, that is secondary training of the feeling, emotion. What I want, that I will be able to do, not what I understand. How emotion and decision making are related. Sister Nivedita also pointed out the importance for technical education, but she said something very interesting. She said, technical education, very important for India, but it must not be divorced from theoretical education. She said, to teach engineering skills without teaching physics and mathematics, it's like having a flower and we're taking it away from the plant, a flower blossom without any roots, a branch without the tree, it will not live. She gives a very interesting comparison. You teach skills, but you do not teach the theory behind it, then what will happen? It's like divorcing the hand from the eye and divorcing both hand and eye from the mind. This complete understanding, mind, senses, Sense organs, motor organs. This complete uh, education. You see, technical skills, they flow from engineering skills. They flow from physics. They flow from chemistry. From the basic sciences. You, unless one gives importance to basic sciences and practical knowledge, the divorce between the two is fatal. Today we are suffering from it. Few years ago, um, director of, uh, the, at that time the director of uh, IIT Chennai was telling me 
that uh, now there is this industry um, uh, industry uh, institution at IIT and industry collaboration, university industry collaboration. So whatever skills the students need the, uh, the, in the industry, those are being taught in the institute. And he told me this is disastrous. What, what the industry is doing is they are passing on their tra training costs to the institute. Here they are supposed to teach fundamental skills and knowledge not how to operate a particular machine in a particular company. In the name of industry education collaboration, they are passing on what their responsibility to the institute. We are supposed to teach science. We are supposed to teach fundamental insights into the nature of the, of, of, of the universe. And then practical skills. 100 years ago, Sister Nivedita pointed this out. You cannot divorce she gave tremendous importance for technical education, but not divorced from basic science. And she gave so much importance to research. We just heard Jagadish Boshu, how she encouraged Jagadish Boshu. But also, the Tata Institute, even now the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore is known as the Tata Institute. And there if you go, um, Nivedita's contribution, Swami Vivekananda inspired Tata to start an institute for fundamental research. Imagine a sannyasi in the 19th century, a businessman, two of them are getting together and the conclusion, mutual conclusion is basic research in science, in modern science is necessary for the country. That led to the growth of the Indian Institute of Science and Nivedita's role is central because Tata faced a lot of difficulties in starting it and Sister Nivedita helped. I went to the Indian Institute of Science and they were telling me how many of its graduates later on they established the uh, Atomic Research Center, the Bhava Atomic Research Center, the uh, TIFR, then some of the IITs, they have their roots in the Tata Institute in Bangalore and that has, it, has its roots in Nivedita, uh, Tata and Vivekananda. You can see in one sense Vivekananda is like a pioneer of Indian science and technology today. You can trace it back, straight to Vivekananda, just a few ideas given by Swami Vivekananda. Another thing Nivedita said, the role of philanthropy in education. One thing I'm amazed, one thing I really, I really like about United States, that I enjoy their universities, the public institutions. Universities, museums, libraries, parks, magnificent. The importance that we give to temples in our country, they give that imp importance to universities in, 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 in their country, in the West. One of my favorite places in New York, in Manhattan, is this uh, Schwarzman Research Library. Uh, magnificent. Four million books. A seven-story building underground just to store the books. Seven stories of books underground. And all free. Not one dollar you have to pay them. Any, any book you want, and these are rare books which they will not lend. You just, anybody can go. Make a card free again. Go and sit and read all day. Ask for a book. They will get it. There will be a screen that within 30 minutes your book is coming. You wait. The information will go down to the underground there, there are volunteers, they will load the book, there is a train, book train. The books will be loaded on that and you come upstairs and you can get your book and you study. Now my point is, you know how it came? Not US government. No. If you go downstairs, names are given. Rock, Rockefeller. Rockefeller. And other families. They are all top businessmen, capitalists of those days. Carnegie, Rockefeller, they are very rich people. But they use their money for public benefit. This spirit of philanthropy, Sister Nivedita said, at that time when there was not much wealth to be had in India, she said businessmen should get together with educators and establish philanthropic education uh, institutes for the spread of mass education. Some of the most magnificent institutions in America are the libraries in all cities of America. 
huge library system. Nowadays, because of the internet, we do not give so much importance to libraries. But imagine, just before internet, what a great resource it is. Free for everybody, not just students. Anybody who stays in that city, you can simply go to that huge library in every city and you can access all the books. So, and all of this was made possible by philanthropy. And Sister Nivedita pointed out at that time. Luckily now some spirit of philanthropy is coming up among Indian industrialists. I think the Infosys Foundation and all of that, they are beginning to encourage. Sister Nivedita pointed out that Indians have a sense of philanthropy, but it is a religious philanthropy. So I will give some donation to a temple. I will give some donation to, even now in USA, we see the rich Indian community, big temples, gorgeous temples. We say, how about making an endowment to a university? That connection has not yet come in the Indian mind. That is why the very concept of Shikhan Mandir, that is the idea. Education and religion are one and the same thing. Spirituality and education are one and the same thing. For Sister Nivedita, nation building and education were synonymous. You know Japa, Japa repeating the Japa mantra? Nivedita used to repeat the mantra on her Japa mala. Bharat Bhasha, Bharat Bhasha, Bharat Bhasha. That was her mantra. And how would she convert her, her spiritual practice into reality? Through education. So money should flow to mandir, correct. But which mandir? Money should flow to shikhan mandir. To, to education, yes. So that was Nivedita's, one of the central ideas that uh, the, uh, the philanthropic spirit and education should come together. She also, I will end with this idea that education should be based on nationalistic spirit. Not a narrow nationalism, but always based on your roots. First, local roots in your own culture and then be global. I heard a nice story yesterday. She was going to give a speech to some students. When a train stopped, students were there to receive. I think Midnipur person. Um, and students, when she got down from the train, the students shouted, in those days, British India, they shouted, Hippie Pura, Hippie Pura. And she said, why are you shouting Hippie Pura? Uh, this is an English uh, uh, usage. You should say, why Guru Ki Fateh? Why Guru Ki Fateh? Khalsa. The Sikh, Sikh uh, slogan, she said. And she made them shout that. They have roots in your own culture first. And then international. But not in a narrow sense. She wanted roots in a synthetic Indian culture. Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, Parsi, Zoroastrian. Zoroastrian, Parsi the same thing. Jewish. Just by the way, I am telling you, very interesting, in New York, in the Consul General, uh, Indian Consul General, they celebrated the most important Jewish festival, Hanukkah, there. Indian Jewish community there. And uh, I was asked to give a talk there, so I went there, there are a lot of um, members, important members from the Jewish community in New York, and including the Israeli Consul General. Uh, just by the way, I'm telling you this. The Israeli Consul General stood up and gave, in his speech, he said, I meet Jews from all over the world, from the diaspora in different countries. Usually they are unhappy about the country of their residence because persecution. They have faced a lot of suffering in different countries of the world. We all know about Nazism and Hitler and all that. Except, he said, except the Jews from India. The Jewish population, Jews who have come from India, they are very happy about India. They said that we are the only country which has never persecuted, never harmed us, and always allowed us freedom to preserve our culture and religion, and has protected us. Anyway, just by the way, so Sister Nivedita wanted education based on Indian nationalism but in an inclusive sense of Indian nationalism. So my time is over and the points I wanted to give are also, I, have, I think I have been able to present before you. I am really thankful to Principal Maharaj for inviting me to be here uh, in this institution which is very close to my heart. And also this 150th birth anniversary of Sister Nivedi takes a great blessing because I must 
honestly admit, I had not seriously studied Nivedita's works earlier. This occasion made me look deeper into Nivedita's works and there's a vast treasure, especially for an institution like this, like uh, Shikhan Mandir, which is a teacher education institution. Nivedita has given a lot of uh, ideas, uh, practical schemes, which are of great use and relevance for teacher education. So with these few words, uh, I take leave of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.